Let's call uh, item two. Item number two is a resolution urging the mayor's office and Department of Public Health to ensure no gap in services for the hundreds of people served daily by the Tenderloin Service Center. Members of the public who wish to provide public comment on this item should call 415-655-0001. When prompted, enter meeting ID 2493-481-7808, then pound, and then pound again. If you haven't already done so, please dial star 3 to line up to speak. The system prompt will indicate that you have raised your hand. Please wait until the system indicates that you have been unmuted, and you may begin your comments when we go to public comment. Thank you, Madam Clerk. So, uh, colleagues, I introduced this uh, resolution last month um, urging the Mayor's Office and Department of Public Health uh, to ensure that replacement services are available for the hundreds of visitors that use the Tenderloin Center daily. Um, they, this is a resolution that I was hoping I would not have to introduce um, and only did so after our office could not get uh, any meaningful commitments uh, from the administration around uh, replacement of the Tenderloin Center and its services. Um, we reach, have reached out to the mayor's office, uh, met with Department of Public Health uh, several times, um, and have asked for details and, and commitments uh, in writing and uh, have not received those to date. So uh, since it opened less than a year ago, the Tenderloin Center has seen, I believe it is now at 112,000 visits um, by people seeking basic dignity services, uh, safe space, harm reduction, um, connections to housing, medical and behavioral health services, um, and as of uh, the most recent data we have, the Tenderloin Center has reversed uh, 280 uh, overdoses, um, and that which is which is about an average of an overdose um, being reversed every day that the Tenderloin Center has been operating. Uh, the prospect of this center closing with no replacement in sight is untenable for the neighborhood and for uh, every person who utilizes the services offered there. Um, I, I will say at this point that I am extremely frustrated uh, and a bit angry that as of today, it appears uh, from everything we know that the plan is simply to shut down the Tenderloin Center without lining up timely replacement services or ensuring that any organizations uh, receiving referrals have the capacity to take on a significant increase uh, in the number of clients uh, placing countless people at risk of being referred to services that aren't available to them or of getting no help uh, whatsoever. And I, I, I don't say this lightly, but I think the lack of replacement services, if that's where we end up, uh, will place uh, more people at significant risk of overdosing and potentially dying uh, on our streets, uh, which is the last thing any of us want. So I hope things have changed. I mean, things can change quickly. I've seen them change quickly, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse in this city. Uh, I am hoping we will hear a different plan today. Um, but as I said, to date, uh, there's been a lack of any plan communicated to our office or the public other than the closure of the center, and it's deeply concerning. Um, I, I want to recognize and thank Dr. Cunnins and her team um, for their work. Um, I think we made significant progress in the overdose prevention plan um, that, that uh, came about, and, um, and, and I think, I, I will say that I think that Dr. Cunnins and her team fully understand and appreciate how important this this work is as we try to address the overdose crisis and I think we've made big strides recently to formulate the plan that I that I referenced um, on overdoses one that is was written by Department of Public Health uh, signed off on by the mayor um, with I believe very broad buy-in from advocates and uh, and certainly our office um, and uh, I think there are positive commitments and goals that are set in there. But what is uh, notably absent in the overdose prevention plan and the presentation of it and all the discussions is a commitment around what replaces the services um, at the Tenderloin Center. Um, and so my hope is uh, today in, in this hearing on our resolution and, and the board's uh, anticipated action on the resolution should it be forwarded uh, from this committee uh, will help us get more clarity on the Tenderloin Center closure plan, how we can make sure that folks uh, who rely on the center have somewhere 
to go when it closes. Um, and, and I want to note that the administration was able to open the Tenderloin Center. It was at the time known as the Linkage Center. Within, I think it was less than a month of, of announcing its intention to open it. Um, so we have over a month before the Tenderloin Center uh, is scheduled to close. So I've got to say, you know, I hear encounter a lot of people who say well, the window's closed and it's too late. It's not actually. And uh, if we have the commitment to do it, like let's get it done. Uh, let's open a new hub that will serve the people who use the Tenderloin Center. If we cannot do that, you know, by December 4th when the services are scheduled to end, let's talk about a short extension of that time uh, to the point when we have something else up and running uh, for people to transition to. I, I, I think this is an area, I think there are a lot of things that divide us as political leaders in the city. I actually think that the overdose prevention plan was a great example of the areas of common ground and frankly of doing what as a city we did very well, especially early on in the COVID um, pandemic where, where we let public health officials take the lead, make the recommendations. We let health advocates take the lead and make the recommendations. Um, and then political leaders figured out how to get it done and support those efforts. That's what we should be doing with our overdose crisis. I believe that's what's reflected in the overdose prevention plan, but it is not what's reflected in our plans around the Tenderloin Center, at least not yet. So um, I very much appreciate all the work that went into the overdose prevention plan. I appreciate the broad support. I think we're at over 50 organizations who have sent us a letter uh, supporting this resolution um, and urging no gap in services. I wanna thank my early co-sponsors, Vice Chair Chan uh, and Supervisor Ronan, as well as uh, President Walton uh, and, and Supervisor Peskin for their support of the resolution. And I hope others will, will join as well. Um, and with that, I will uh, turn it over to Dr. Uh, Cunnins, who's here today on behalf of uh, Department of Public Health. Uh, and I believe the mayor's office, represented by Tom Paulino, is uh, available for questions, I believe, on uh, appearing remotely. Dr. Cunnins, welcome. Hopefully you have big news to break in this moment that will completely change my uh, perspective on this issue. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Thank you, uh, Chair Preston, Vice Chair Chen, Supervisor Mandelman. Thank you for calling us together today. And <clears throat> I'm Dr. Hillary Cunnins, Director of Behavioral Health Services and Mental Health SF for the Department of Public Health. I'm joined today by my colleague, Ms. Krista Geta, who is the director of the Tenderloin Response for DPH and will be uh, presenting and answering uh, your questions uh, today. We do have a brief slideshow, which is uh, which you can see up before you. Um, uh, next slide. I, I'm realizing I, uh, I'm going to turn away just to be able to read the slides. Um, as, as you remarked, um, we opened the Tenderloin Center on January 18th, 2022. I do want to reflect we did do that rapidly and what enabled us to do it with that rapidity as part, it was as part of the emergency order and the emergency order uh, initiative in partnership with our colleagues from really across the city, importantly, Department of Emergency Management, uh, HSH, HSA, and DPW. Uh, DPH took over the Tenderloin Center as of uh, July 1st, but I really do want to note this was part of a larger strategy uh, in a multi-pronged plan to stabilize the neighborhood with the goals of reducing uh, overdose deaths. Uh, as well as making other contribu important contributions to people's health. As you remark, the Tenderloin Center is serving approximately 400 people per day, seven days a week at 1170 Market, uh, which is in UN Plaza. Next slide. So we wanted to share with you some of our key, what we believe to be the key impacts and services. You cited some, this is actually data from last week. Um, we have placed approximately 1,000 individuals or connected them with shelter and 211 connected with permanent housing. 
uh, approximately 637 people have completed enrollments into CalFresh, Medi-Cal, and CAP. We have provided more than 8,000 showers, more than 3,000 loads of laundry, over 25,000 on-site behavioral health, physical health, and social service connections, and as you remark, uh, 280 overdoses have been reversed. What's on the slide is last week's data. More than 300 individuals have been connected with specialty behavioral health services. Next slide. As you also already remarked, and really thanks to uh, a fantastic team at DPH, as well as collaborations across uh, the city with other city agencies, uh, we, um, and with input, I should say, from many uh, community members and organizations, we issued a four-point comprehensive plan to address the crisis of overdose deaths. You can see the four points on the slide in front of you, increasing access and availability to a continuum of substance use services, strengthening community engagement and support for people at high risk of overdose, implement a whole city approach to overdose, and as we previously discussed, meaning really working across our colleague agencies and with every sector who has the potential to touch and reduce the risk of overdose of people they may be serving, and then finally increase our ability to track the epidemic, monitor change, and adjust programming as needed. Next slide. The other, um, the other uh, slide, which I have just previously shown uh, in our prior treatment on demand hearing, just the conceptual framework for what we are uh, representing and seeing ourselves doing at the Tenderloin Center. Um, we see this as part of an important continuum of services we are aiming to offer people. In this slide, what you see from left to right is services on the left are aiming to serve people who might be, as the stage of change in health behavior theory suggests, pre-contemplative, people who are not necessarily ready in the moment to make a change in terms of their substance use or other health uh, conditions. We are aiming to match services to that group in order to engage people in that level of care, that part of the continuum, aiming to move them along all the way to the right side of that slide where you see formal treatment services, whether they're residential, outpatient, medication treatment, and including, importantly, other supportive living environments like sober living. These are aiming at folks who are either making changes uh, or, or action phase of their behavior change or in the maintenance phase of their behavior change, meaning they have made significant changes and are looking to maintain um, their abstinence or sobriety or other health behavior changes that they are seeking to continue. Next slide. Um, and the services at the TLC are just one part of what we believe to be the multi-pronged uh, approach we are taking to reduce overdose and public drug use. Many of these changes have been made under the uh, rubric of Mental Health SF, as you know, the legislated framework to improve our behavioral health system. And you can see on the slide the, the elements of the progress we have made and that many of you have heard about already. We have an opened more than 250 residential care and treatment slots, most recently including Soma Rise, which is a 24-7 drug sobering center. We have expanded hours of access uh, at our behavioral health access center where people can come in seeking help getting assessed. We have also expanded hours at our office-based buprenorphine induction clinic where people can come in and, and get treatment initiated uh, using buprenorphine and at our BART Market, uh, Market Street site, which is a contracted service for an opioid treatment program offering both methadone, buprenorphine, and also counseling. Additional progress, as you are aware, we have established the street crisis response teams, the street overdose response teams, 
Additionally, we are expanding our access uh, and availability of contingency management, which is a uh, treatment intervention specifically with science behind it to reduce, um, uh, support people with stimulant use disorders, that is uh, methamphetamine or cocaine. Finally, I'll just mention that the Behavioral Health Pharmacy has also expanded its hours and additionally um, is able to deliver medications, uh, specifically buprenorphine, which uh, the idea here is to help people continue to receive their medication. We know, and I should just comment at the top, that people who are um, with an opioid use disorder who are receiving medication-assisted treatment with buprenorphine or methadone are at reduced risk of overdose, as well as achieving lower levels of drug use, including abstinence from all illicit drugs. And this form of treatment has the best data around retention in care and reduction in these important health outcomes, particularly mentioning overdose. Next slide. I also want to call attention to our uh, ambitious goals uh, that we released in our overdose plan. In one to two years, we are aiming to establish at least two wellness homes, hubs sorry, that co-locate needed services and improve the health of people who use drugs. We are aiming to open 70 additional residential step-down beds. These are um, residential sites for people leaving residential treatment for substance use disorder where they can stay, continue to stabilize, receive outpatient substance use disorder treatment while living in a supported uh, place. We are aiming to open 40 new beds for people, women with dual diagnoses, serving women of the Bayview. This was a recommendation from our uh, Prop C committee, which we are in the process of implementing. We are also aiming to increase the number of people receiving medications for addiction treatment by 30%, by 20% within one to two years, increase the number of programs offering contingency management from three to five. My reading is blocked by the... Uh, the words, we are also aiming to increase our, thank you, distribution of naloxone from 47 to 75,000 kits annually. Naloxone is an important part of our plan to get this emergency reversal medicine into the hands of people who might be in the position to witness an overdose and respond and save a life. And then finally, we, want, we are aiming to increase naloxone availability in supportive housing facilities in the city, working with our colleagues from HSH. Next slide. Part, a key part of our overdose prevention plan is to establish wellness hubs, which we are defining and describing here as neighborhood-based programs tailored to meet and improve the health of people who use drugs with a specific focus on preventing overdose deaths. Services will include overdose prevention, access to treatment, linkage to shelter and benefits. Our goal is to open at least two wellness hubs within the next year in neighborhoods disproportionately affected uh, by the epidemic. And as we have discussed previously, any new site, proposed site will include community engagement including required uh, Prop I notifications. Next slide. Yeah. Um, so as far as our next steps, um, we appreciate very much, uh, Chair Preston, you're raising the important concerns and the value of the services we have been able to provide to people at the TLC. We are continuing to aggressively explore every option we can to be able to um, transition those services. This, um, in addition, we have also, uh, in, or in parallel, de are developing, have developed a transition plan uh, both pr preceding any possible closure and following the closure in order to maintain uh, continuity of services. 
The other uh, important next step, we just, as you know, issued the overdose plan uh, within the last few weeks, and we are aiming to begin and have already uh, to implement the important elements of that plan. Um, I think that's the last slide, and I am happy to take questions along with my colleague, Ms. Gaeta. Thank you, Director Cunnins, and um, I believe uh, Mr. Paulino is on the line available for questions. I don't know if you had any uh, presentation or anything that you wanted to add from the mayor's office. Uh, floor is yours, Mr. Paulino, if you would like to say anything. Thank you, Chair Preston. No, uh, no presentation, but available for questions for y'all. Thank you. Uh, I do have some questions. So, um, the goal. I wanted to get a little more specific around the goals. So you've you've stated the goal of opening two wellness hubs in the next year, prioritizing impacted neighborhoods as described. Um, the overdose prevention plan commits to opening one wellness hub this calendar year. A little less clear in year two. I think it's one or more additional ones next year. So if we can take that piece by piece. So does the commitment remain to opening a wellness hub this calendar year? Um, so we are... Um we are working to adhere to that commitment. We, um, we are considering uh, site or sites and are working through what our last, um, our sort of late logistics and feasibility around particular, about establishing the particular site. We, um, we are committed to also doing uh, community engagement um, and rolling out a, f a first site, I will say as expeditiously as possible, and I am I remain hopeful that it will be this calendar year. Can you confirm what I believe to be the case that that site is not in the Tenderloin Civic Center or the immediate area where the the Tenderloin Center is currently operating. Um, I will sh I will share that we have had challenges in locating a new Tenderloin site. Um, there are many, as as you um, as you and I had discussed, needs for that we see as need, physical needs of a potential any potential site, including uh, outdoor space, enough space for folks to come in and, and rest and, and yeah, gain. If I could just, because we'll get to the Tenderloin site, I just want to get clear sure. for the public that you remain hopeful that you can, that this city can fulfill the commitment to get this first wellness hub up and running by the end of the calendar year, understanding there's community engagement, there's an announcement whenever that comes uh, to get on track. I just want to get clear for the public that that, that, that optimism around opening the first wellness hub what we are talking about, uh, even though you're not prepared to announce a location at this point, I think it is my understanding that that is not in the Tenderloin Civic Center or immediate vicinity of the of the current TL Center. I just want to get that clear before we start talking about what may come after. That site is not in the immediate area of the Tenderloin Center and is not a replacement for the Tenderloin Center. Is that right? Yes. Thank you. And, then, and so then, then you were anticipating the next question, okay, which is, so once, well, l let me ask you, do you, do you I, I understand you're not prepared to announce uh, the, the site, the 2022 site um, at this time, but do you have an estimate as to when we can expect to hear uh, from DPH uh, the location of that site? Um, Soon, I know that is not precise. Um, I think we are making sure that um, what we intend to offer at the site is feasible given physical constraints, and we would be, and we don't want it to uh, not be feasible before announcing. Uh, and and I would also again reiterate 
announcing with the intent of uh, speaking with community members uh, to, so that we can get feedback, understand potential um, hopes for the site and, and, put, and get feedback about how we might organize the site. Thank you, and I certainly support the engagement. I think one of the frustrating things from my perspective is that by waiting till the last minute on these things, we are virtually guaranteeing the sort of community reaction and fight over these things that I don't think would exist at the same level were we to be more open uh, with, our, with our process, our locations, and really do more meaningful engagement. That certainly was the case with the Tenderloin Center, where a lot of folks who I think otherwise would have embraced and worked together on it uh, instead learned about it in the San Francisco Chronicle the day it opened, right? Or, or was the day it was announced. Um, so, so I would just, that's more a comment than a question, but just encourage that that, that announcement, especially if we're trying to be on track to open by the end of the year, the first wellness hub, that that announcement be made as soon as possible so we can all work together on that uh, engagement and on dispelling a lot of the, the myths and misinformation that often circulates about what, uh, what services are provided at these sites. I appreciate the comment very much. I, I think the, uh, again, we, the TLC was opened extremely quickly um, and under the condition of an emergency order. And, and this is uh, not the condition that we are, would be opening cu current or future wellness hubs. Thank you. The, the, the future site a, a future, I guess, second, well, let me ask, will the second wellness hub that is open be a, be one that is in the Tenderloin or Civic Center area and can actually serve a lot of the same people uh, that are using the Tenderloin Center now? We, um, we don't, I mean, I'll say this again, is we don't yet have an identified site. We, um, I'll ask you and really any potential listeners for, for assistance in helping to identify a site. As you know, in San Francisco, real estate is often a cha the challenge or a major challenge in, uh, in establishing services. Um, we are looking, seeking a site that would have out potential for outdoor space. I think I started to say this indoor space where people can come in and find resp or respite, hygiene, um, and individual rooms where people similar to at the TLC can meet privately with providers to get linked into further services or, or health care. Is there a commitment to opening a replacement site for the Tenderloin Center in that general area in the, well, let me ask it differently because there have been different <laughs> representations made that are not inconsistent but that need clarification. I believe what was said to the, the in the Planning Commission memo uh, from DPH was that, that a site will be open by the end of the year, and not, not meaning this year, right, um, in, to, in the Tenderloin area, and then that was further um, clarified a, a, the, a, a call with many advocates uh, and Tenderloin community members there that what was meant by that was end of the fiscal year. So I, I'm trying to pinpoint, uh, you know, we can, we can discuss and we'll get the mayor's office perspective too on the timing in relation to the closure of the Tenderloin Center. But there's also just even that issue aside, getting some clarity on even if there were not that pressure, what timeline we're working under. So are, are we talking about a Tenderloin or, or, or Civic Center wellness hub by June 30th, 2023? Or are we talking about it by the end of the calendar year, 2023? What, what is the commitment there? Um, I will just share my, the public, I think what is a common sense public health perspective, which is we are wanting this to happen as soon as possible. We are, um, t prior to the fiscal year, would be 
you know, in, in that in that time frame. And there are I, pragmatic logistical challenges around site identification that we are seeking to resolve. And that that is a, I would say, central um, reason why we could not achieve that goal. And so if, if, if our office identified a site tomorrow that met your specifications, we would then be on track to open, this would be opened I would, soon? I would just, I would say yes, and I'd want to bring that back to check with our um, ability to contract with a not-for-profit who could run the site uh, and our ability to establish that contract. But I think that is our hope, and I hope you can identify a site tomorrow. Well, I, I'm not saying we can. I'm, I, I will say it's, it's news to our office if the administration's position is now that the, that the only barrier here, it's not the political will, it's not many other issues, it's just identifying a site. If that's the only barrier, you know, we can work on that, right? We, and I, I would like to hear from the mayor's office, Mr. Paulino, if, that's, if, if that is your view as well, that the, that the only obstacle to us opening and activating a uh, wellness hub uh, in the Tenderloin or Civic Center area right now uh, is, is the availability of a site. Thank you for the question, Chair Preston. I, I can't speak to the specifics around all of the um, uh, technical considerations that Director Cunnins had uh, a bit spoken to with regards to identifying a site, but uh, our office would absolutely be happy to collaborate with your office in identifying potential sites. Um, like I said, uh, Director Cunnins and DPH would have a little bit more information into the specifics that would go into uh, the requirements for a potential site, but absolutely happy to, to collaborate with your office and your staff. Thank you, Mr. Paulino. Let me follow up beyond just uh, your offer to collaborate, which is well received, and I look forward to, to collaborating. We will get on the record in a minute, I hope, from uh, our Director uh, of Behavioral Health here, uh, some more details about what a site would need to look like to be usable for a wellness hub in or around the Tenderloin. My question is, uh, if somebody watching this hearing uh, should emerge in, in you know, the days that follow with a site that meets those specifications, do we have a commitment from the mayor's office and Department of Public Health to move forward uh, uh, on an expedited basis and open a wellness hub uh, in, in the Tenderloin or Service Center area? I mean, from, from our office and as DPH had set out or a couple of months ago that they had uh, put together this plan for over uh, months to identify potential sites. Um, as far as uh, the word expedited, I'm not sure exactly kind of what you mean insofar as that, but it, but the goal of, uh, of uh, the winding down of the services specifically at the Tenderloin Linkage Center was always to identify uh, the opportunities for those services to continue to make sure that there is not a gap in those services. Thank you, we certainly share that goal. So uh, Mr. Paulino, on behalf of the mayor's office, why is the site scheduled to close and cease uh, delivering services on December 4th when there is no replacement site activated? Well, from the beginning, uh, Chair Preston, this was always a temporary uh, 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 center. Um, and as I mentioned, as far as what DPH had uh, announced a couple of months ago, and so far as uh, developing a plan to uh, ensure that those services that the Tenderloin Linkage Center provides do not uh, end with the winding down of the actual Tenderloin Center itself. Um, is what DPH has been doing over the past couple of months is, uh, is uh, identifying potential sites, ensuring that community partners would be available to uh, partner with to make sure that those services get to, to those individuals, um, but that from the beginning, the site was, was, was intended to be temporary. I, I, and let me be clear, I don't think anyone's arguing for the Tenderloin Center to be permanent in that location. I think there are very different views reflected in this resolution regarding, regarding whether to close it when no new site has been, has been activated. So I, I, I Mr. Paulino, it, it, if you could just address that timing issue, like why, why has, the mayor has not, to my knowledge, I, uh, approached the board about working together to extend 
uh, the, the time of the Tenderloin Center until a new uh, site is opened, um, and in fact has done the opposite and said there won't be a new site by that time and we are closing on that date. Um, so that, that's why if we all share the goal of making sure there isn't a gap in services, why is there not a commitment to keeping the Tenderloin Center open until the replacement is open? Um, I will, Chair President, I think the, uh, the logic behind the development of the plan for uh, uh, alternatives to the, the center itself was to, to learn the lessons from uh, the Tenderloin Linkage Center's operation over the last year. Um, and whether it's, um, uh, you know, uh, better coordination and partnership with community providers um, or uh, identif identifying of multiple sites, uh, various sites, excuse me, from, from the Tenderloin Linkage Center. I think that's been the process that DPH has been undertaking over the past couple months. And to Director Cunnins' point um, earlier, as far as any announcements forthcoming that uh, uh, DPH may be announcing within um, uh, within the coming months, I think it speak to the, to the work that has happened over the past couple of months uh, to make sure that there are no gaps in those services. What is the timeline that the mayor's office is committing to for a wellness hub in or near the Tenderloin? Um, I, I can't speak to any particular time commitment um, as far as a hard date. Um, but like I said, I think that, you know, we share the same goal as making sure that there are no lapse in services here. And that is what we, the administration continues to support DPH to make sure that that does not happen. Or excuse me, that that does happen. And Director Cunnins, what is the process once a site is identified uh, in terms of uh, there's Prop I notification, there's, uh, I don't know if there's an RFP regarding uh, the services on site. Can, uh, can you describe that process and if everyone were working as quickly as possible, uh, how, how much time that would take? Um, I may ask uh, for some for an assist from uh, Ms. Gaeta for this, but the initial process is to identify a site. We would need to assess the site to see if there's any needed renovation, construction, internal changes. Um, we would then, depending on the circumstances with advice from our DPH uh, business and contracting office, would be advised about what our the ways we could procure uh, the, serv the service provider there. Um, one way forward could be an RFP, um, and some of the timelines would be, as I understand it, dependent on the particular circumstances and, and ways we might be able to procure the service. One, one thing I will say is that one, lesson learned from the TLC is, um, is that the site, and thanks to our many providers who helped run the site and were invaluable to the great number of services we we're able to offer, it also um, made some of the uh, procurement, contracting, and so forth uh, cha challenged the timeline. And so one of the lessons learned uh, both from a uh, procurement point of view and also an operations point of view, is having a lead uh, single provider would be a faster and easier way to operate the site. Thank you. Um, so can you describe the, um, and I don't know if this is for Ms. Uh, Ms. Gaeta or, or, or yourself, but so what, it, what is the plan currently for DPH if, if there is not an extension of the Tenderloin Center, if services are terminated effective December 4th, if there is no replacement hub in anywhere near the area, what's the plan for the approximately 400 people per day who are visiting that site for help? Let me reiterate, and then I will turn us uh, turn you over to Ms. Gaeta, is that we are still um, pushing as hard as we can uh, and exploring every option to um, eliminate or reduce any potential gap. And as I indicated, we are v at the same time hard at work getting ready for a potential transition plan. And I'll ask Ms. Gaeta I, to so help be there. Before Ms. Gaeta addresses I, I mean... 
we worked closely together on a detailed plan. DPH knows what a plan looks like and knows how to put together a plan to actually succeed. That's what we saw, in the, I think, in the overdose prevention plan. Like, we don't have anything like that. We are a month out, and, and if, Ms. Gator, if you want to address this, I, I, I mean, what are, who's going to be on the ground come December 5th? What organizations in and around the Tenderloin have been, have there been discussions with and hopefully agreements signed around and, and, and knowledge of their capacity to take up to 400 more people for various different services? And can they serve those people, right? Have there been requests for additional funding to do that? How are people going to physically get from the center to those places, right? I mean, and I'm not telling you anything. I mean, Department of Public Health knows how to create a plan. I haven't seen one. The, 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 all due respect, I mean, the, the, the planning part of this in terms of what's been presented is very vague. So I, I would either, either Director Cunnins or, or Ms. Gata, if you, can, can you tell us in more detail if there's no extension of the Tenderloin Center and there's no replacement site, what are we looking at from December 5th on? Yeah, yeah, thanks for that question. It's very important. It's something that we are thinking a lot about at the Tenderloin Center. So I happen to uh, be part of the management structure there and work with the staff uh, to operate the site every day. But then we have been thinking about various scenarios. Um, and one of those scenarios is that we do close on December 4th. So here are a couple of the things that we're doing. Uh, we have put together an internal service transition team, um, and what we're really fortunate is we have HSH at the table, HSA at the table, we have Code Tenderloin, we have Harm Reduction Therapy Center, we have Health Right 360. These are all folks who are providing services on the site. There's a group of staff right now identifying clients who are in a housing process. So they are working with the coordinated entry providers there, and they are they are getting assessed and maybe being placed into housing. We are doing we are figuring out who those folks are and making sure that if they don't get placed before the Tenderloin Center closes, we are we are transitioning them with a warm handoff to the to another access point. Folks who are in a GA, Medi-Cal, or CalFresh process, we are working to identify all of them, and if they are not completed with their enrollments, we are going to be helping them with a warm handoff to the service centers. We are providing hundreds of um, therapy sessions for uh, mental health and uh, substance use with Harm Reduction Therapy Center. We are working with those clinicians to make sure that those cl clients are transitioned to another site that HRTC um, it works at. And then we are also trying to identify our folks who are most at risk to have a continuity plan for them. So who are the folks that are most vulnerable? So we will try to do that throughout this month if we indeed close um, so that we can make sure that those who with the most needs are transitioned to other services and in some cases moving with somebody that they're already working with at the center. On December 5th, we are developing a robust plan with all those same folks. We will be on site, including the Office of Overdose Prevention, so that's DPH staff. We will have Narcan on site. We will be monitoring and re reversing overdoses if we need to. We will be there doing wayfinding and navigating to other services, um, so thinking about the services that folks are accessing on our site, so that's meals or showers or just safe place to be, and we will be providing alternatives. Um, so we'll be walking folks over to meal places, we'll be walking folks over to Soma Rise and other, other places so that they're not just abandoned on December 5th, but we'll be there for several weeks doing that, that wayfinding. Thank you. I, um, have there been... The, the types of contacts I was referring to with other providers in the Tenderloin to assess their capacity to take these handoffs, uh, what their needs are, if they can do that within existing budget or will be having additional requests? I think that's a next step for us. Right now, we have been working with the folks that we know that we can transition and we know there's some capacity, um, but we do plan to do more community outreach in the coming, coming week or so. And there are some services that are provided at the Tenderloin Center that you cannot hand off, right? That, that at this there's nowhere point, to send people. most um, services are offered somewhere else. But not all. Not in, all. In, in particular, most of the overdose prevention work. Yes. I, I you know, I will say it. It is uh, we are we are often not talking. Uh, to or, or at the people who are 
driving some of the problems in these hearings. So I, I want to recognize the work, your work at the Tenderloin Center and the frankly impossible position that the Department of Public Health, the nonprofits who are working, who, some of whom you mentioned, Health Rate, uh, 360, Code Tenderloin, uh, and others, um, are providing on site the I am not a public health professional. I have many in my family and extended family. The idea that the plan here is basically after you've built up goodwill for 10 months, uh, that somehow in a few weeks, you're gonna effectively transition people who are in the middle of that trust building and you know, you're gonna do that successfully with this entire you know, population of folks, it, it seems unrealistic to say the least, and the uncertainties that everyone's operating under uh, are unnecessary. And were there a clear commitment, and I'll ask the mayor's office, but were there a clear commitment to, to extend the center and or get a site up and running, um, you wouldn't have to be doing all that work. It's just, it's just uh, remarkable to me the amount of sort of everyone chasing their tail that, that is required here instead of being able to focus on the substantive work that everyone is doing at the Tenderloin Center, saving lives and figuring out how to get more people in, that we are instead having this level of uncertainty just a month before the potential closure. Um, but but let, me, let me ask this, and, and, and thank you um, for your, you know, your presentation on that, but one of the, the director Cunnins, you referred to one of the reasons we can move so quickly last time is we had a declaration of a state of emergency that allowed us to do this on an expedited basis. I, I wanted to, like that emergency hasn't gone away, illegally it has, I understand the declaration of state of emergency has gone, but the conditions in terms of overdoses giving rise to that emergency are not significantly different today than they were at that time, right? Um, I think the one new piece of information we have is that overdose deaths declined as we recently reported by about 10% in 2021 compared to 2020. That said, the numbers of overdoses in San Francisco still remain at epidemic levels. Right. We're still absolutely at crisis level and we will celebrate any reduction we have, every, every individual life, but, but to Mr. Paulino for, for the mayor's office, if, if, part of the, if the part of the barrier to moving quickly here is that we don't have a state of emergency, why, is, why do we not just have a new declaration of state of emergency? Like, like what is different today than was different last December when the mayor determined that the circumstances warranted a, a, a proclamation of emergency and the ability to move more quickly forward. If, thank you for the question, Chair President. I, um, well, I can't speak to if there would be another uh, uh, declaration um, coming down, uh, coming down the pike. I can't say that uh, the declaration from last year, uh, as Director Cunnins has mentioned, and as, as the board knows, was essentially expedited the ability for us to uh, procure the space, to, uh, to staff the space, and to make sure those services uh, came up as quickly as possible. But as I, as I mentioned earlier, the past couple of months, DPH has been spent, uh, has been spending the time to identify uh, alternate sites, alternate um, uh, uh, ways in which we can make sure those services to those communities are delivered. Um, so insofar as needing a new uh, declaration uh, in order to either expedite uh, processes here, again, I can't necessarily speak to it, but insofar as the planning that has gone in to make sure that there are alternates to the Tenderland Linkage Center uh, following the winding down of those services, that's what the past couple of months have been spent doing. And Mr. Paulino, given that what we're hearing is there's not going to be an alternative in place by the time of closure, um, what is the mayor's office position regarding uh, short-term extension of the services provided at the Tenderloin Center so that all of our hardworking folks at the Department of Public Health and our uh, 
healthcare providers and others can focus on the task of delivering care, not wind, prematurely winding down services when they uh, or have uh, no replacement option. What, what's the mayor's position on, expending, on extending the TL Center uh, operations beyond the December date? Uh, well, I, I don't want to put words in Director Cunningham's mouth, and I don't know if she had she had mentioned this, but there, the um, uh, the, fa the, the fact that there won't be a site identified by the closure of or the proposed closure of the center, I don't think is entirely accurate. I think she uh, ha had outlined that they are working and in the process of identifying alternate sites, so that by the closure there is uh, or, or are alternative sites. Uh, identified to be able to continue those services. Um, but as far as to your question around extending, um, uh, what was the question around well, extending let, 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 the, the you know, linkage center itself? Let's get back to my question after we clarify what you just said, because what you just said is very different from what I'm hearing from the Department of Public Health. I don't think that our Department of Public Health is representing that they will be announcing a wellness hub, the first one, that will in any way be a replacement for the services provided at the Tenderloin Center. That seems to be what you are saying, Mr. Polino. It does not seem to be what I'm hearing from Department of Public Health. And I think we have to understand the whole point of these wellness hubs in the overdose prevention plan and decentralizing them is an understanding these are very localized. They serve people in a very localized community. And, and so let, let's get clear on that And before, before we answer the other question. They, there will not be a wellness hub announced that will be activated by the end of this calendar year as a replacement for the Tenderloin Center and the folks served there, right? I just want to be clear because I, what I'm hearing from, from Mr. Paulino is, is, is trying to conflate the other center somewhere else that, and Wellness Hub that you may be announcing with this closure. Those are two separate things, right? Yeah, yeah, and well, I apologize first, for any... It, it's sorry. first, I just want to make sure first that director that I'm not misstating what Director Cunnins has been saying. Then we'll go back to you, Mr. Polina. Yeah, you are not misstating um, the well, the well what we believe is a path with a, with a first wellness hub. I do want to just offer, and um, we are still aggressively looking for sites in the Tenderloin and not letting up there. Absolutely, and I appreciate that. But there's two different issues. There's finding a site in the Tenderloin Civic Center area, which can serve as a replacement uh, to some of the services offered at the Tenderloin Center. And then there is the imminent announcement of a wellness hub somewhere else that is not seen by the Department of Public Health as a replacement for the services at the Tenderloin Center, right? Correct. Thank you. So, Mr. Paulino, let it... it, it it, I hope that clarifies. Let me know if the mayor's office has a different perspective on that. But there will not be, unless things change dramatically right now, there will not be a wellness hub opened that is a replacement for the Tenderloin Center. And my question is, given that, if that's what we are stuck with right now, is the mayor's office willing to extend services at the, the Tenderloin Center beyond the planned closure date in December. Thank you for the for the follow-up question, and I apologize for any confusion my remarks might have added there to uh, to Director Cunningham's. As I, I personally cannot speak to uh, to that uh, to your question, uh, Chair Preston, insofar as a commitment to extending that, but I will absolutely take that back to my colleagues here for for consideration and to sync up with your staff afterwards. Thank you. Do you agree that if it's not extended and there's no replacement wellness hub, that there will be a gap in services? Was that question to me? Yes. Okay. So uh, I, I can't necessarily speak to the operations of the services provided. To, I would have to defer to the folks at, at, at DPH insofar as the different community members that they work with and those different systems. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to repeat what I mentioned earlier, but again, it's our goal for, for services to not, uh, to not lapse and for them to continue. Well, there's a very easy way for that to happen, which is you don't terminate the services. Um, Vice Chair Chan. 
Thank you, Chair Preston. This is just a side note to begin with. Mr. Provolino, you're obviously in City Hall. I don't understand why you're not inside a chamber to answer questions because otherwise there will be like less confusion between whether this is a question posed to you or <laughs> Dr. Kunis. Or, you know, so I, I first and foremost, I, I just want to make that clear that I, I, I think that you should be inside a chamber if you are in person in City Hall and answering questions. Um, and and I, I think that this is the question that I have, and, and it's, I, I think, Chair Preston, thank you so much, because I think you already pointed out, it's very clear to us, and I think it's unfortunate for uh, it, its governance uh, by press releases and press announcements that we, we could have done this a year ago and, and have a really uh, an honest conversation about how to best address um, the issues of drug overdose and, and to truly be committed to either the approach and the resources that is actually the most beneficial to most vulnerable population in San Francisco. And that it is unfortunate that we're here and, be, and, and I agree with Chair Preston. Thank you so much for all the work that you've been doing. I am so sorry that you're stuck in the rock and the hard place between you know political stunt and the, actually the real work that you need to do and try to like be adapted and be flexible as much as you can. Um, and so I, I, th I think that is first and foremost, I want to express that thanks to you and that unfortunately the mayor's office can't even be here in person to address and, and answer the questions that they are responsible for. Um, I, I think though, uh, the, the question I want to go back to is that um, help me understand from your expertise. You know, the, it seems like there's a two different approach to address this problem. And one is you know, originally that, you know, as proposed last year as a public health emergency, it, it, the way that it, it, it posed to this body, to the Board of Supervisors, which I voted in support of, it is that I was told and I was informed this is a crisis, a crisis that I think for decades now, but, but nonetheless, I, I actually recognize the seriousness of it and, and the, you know, that, the, that we do need to invest resources and, you know, support for the area. Therefore, I voted in support. But the approach that at that time was we need a centralized space. We need a space that have all like concentrated resources and services in one spot so everyone know where to go. And it's in proximity for the people that they need so we lower the barriers for services. Now suddenly, not suddenly, but, but a year later, now we say, hey, we, we're going to do these wellness centers in different, in, in different hubs and different neighborhoods. Um, I, I think I, what I'm seeking for is some answers to help me understand the differences between the two approach and which one is the most beneficial because I believe that we're going to go unlike we do, this body does not govern by press releases. We, we want to understand what is the best approach and, and with that we want to support and invest resources be it you know, funding and, and however way we can to the Department of Public Health to say how do we address this problem. Uh, thanks, Vice Chair Chan, for that question. Um, <clears throat> let me um, just go back to the top about the, the duration of the crisis. I, I do want to say that nationally the overdose crisis has been going on for more than a decade now. We were spared in San Francisco really until the late 20 teens. And so the time period here, I think, which we and others attribute to some of the very strong programming that has been in place in San Francisco really has hit us hard, primarily driven by fentanyl in the uh, 27, 2018, 2019. So I just wanna sort of acknowledge that uh, some of what we have here had and has is working. That said, I think that we learned a great deal in the, in the 10 months since we've been operating the TLC. Some of our um, approaches, I think, still stand, and some approaches we would change, which is what we are proposing in the wellness hubs. An important driver is size and location um, in, in a particular neighborhood, so that from the provider point of view, it can be a more intimate, uh, space to get to know people, to have continuity over time, 
and to be able to work with both the community members and the individuals as thoughtfully as possible. I think that is a really important lesson, and that is why our uh, desire and approach for sort of a one-stop, I think, as you were describing, and low barrier remains, and we learned from the TLC, if you offer things that people want, they will come and present uh, for assistance or for use or to use services. The smaller sites we feel and have learned are are our best recommendation as of right now. Additionally, I mentioned this earlier, is having a single provider really be managing and in charge of the specific site, allowing for um, uh, uh, consistency of practice uh, and approach across the site. At the same time, we learned, I think, so much with our other city departments. I mentioned uh, DEM, HSH, HSA, DPW, and I think really working to set up new sites in collaboration um, with our colleague agencies in order to bring the many needed services that that folks want to take advantage of is also a critical learning that we don't want to, we won't give up on. This is just my last comment. I, I think that one thing that I'm learning from the Department of Public Health, you know, and, and also the learned lessons for Laguna Honda is that like while that changes is made, it, it's really hard for people to just say, we, we've been offering you some services. I think Chair Preston has mentioned that too. You're finally developing the trust and yet you just say, let's quit cold turkey and let's like not having anything at all. I, and I know that there is a plan of like, how can we transfer these services and making sure that everyone can have to be taken care of. But I, I, I think that is part of learning from Laguna Honda. Transfer trauma is real when when people actually are in need and actually they're they're sick and they're they they how can we expect them to just say, hey, it's December 5th and therefore you're not this is not for you anymore. And and this is just really, uh, I think just we are just re-traumatizing everyone by, by not, by, by on us not being able to provide a smooth transition and be able to make the commitment and say, hey, you know, this is where you could go now from here and on out. And that is just um, disheartening to hear. And, but again, I just want to thank you and your team for, <laughs> for doing everything you can and, and just disappointed that today is November 3rd and that we have less than a month to go. And this is very, this is just, I think this actually wa is wasting our resources as a city and that we just keep, and, and, and that's why constituents always ask, like we have $14 billion budget. Why is it not delivering results? I think that is exact. This is a really good example of how we all try to come together and problem solve. But again, it's because pol the lack of political will or different kind of political will for different agenda, and that's like where we're landing that keep wasting resources and people's time and talents. And I think that actually demoralized the people who pour their heart and soul and time and tears in this work and to say, why? Why are we doing this? And you know, garner no long-term results. So thank you, Dr. Kanes, and thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. Thank you, Vice Chair Chan. Supervisor Mandelman. Um, well, I, I may be about to make uh, your, your life a little more complicated by reminding you that there are a diversity of perspectives on the Board of Supervisors, and I don't think that I uh, fully agree with my colleagues um, on this question. Um, I did vote for the Tenderloin State of Emergency. I do think that uh, the Department of Public Health and service providers have done some extraordinary work there and have learned um, some valuable things. I also have misgivings and reservations about many aspects of how the Linkage Center has rolled out and continued um, and would like to explore a few questions with you. Um, now, so on that first slide, uh, as you talked, we don't have to bring it up, but you talked about uh, the, the Linkage Center being part of a strategy uh, to stabilize the neighborhood. Um, what are the metrics by which DPH thinks about neighborhood stabilization? So, um, so thanks for that question, Supervisor. Um, 
so I think that from a public health point of view, we are aiming to focus on uh, the health metrics. Uh, for us, a prime metric is, is overdose deaths and reduction in overdose deaths. Um, we know that that includes uh, pulling people, engaging people, as you and I and others recently discussed at the Treatment on Demand hearing, includes uh, metrics for numbers of people engaged in the continuum of behavioral health services. We also um, are, as we've stated, concerned about reducing public drug use as an additional public health metric. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would push back just a little bit. Reducing overdoses is unquestionably a, a, an important priority for San Francisco right now. Um, reducing active public drug use, uh, substance use, seems to me to move in the direction of a neighborhood, neighborhood stabilization metric. But I think what most San Franciscans would think needs to happen around neighborhood stabilization in the Tenderloin and Soma is that the open air drug use sales, impassable public spaces, challenges to um, residents and merchants and visitors in feeling safe needs to dissipate and ultimately go away. And um, it's, a, I mean, I, I guess we, I think we are all hoping that interventions like a linkage center or a wellness center would help with that. But if that's not central to DPH's focus, I think that's a problem because I think that is a huge need, not just in the Tenderloin, you know, the Tenderloin is ground zero, but in, in many neighborhoods. Um, so, can, um, yeah. if I may, um, sure. so I concur and we see this as part of our responsibility along with other actors and sectors in the city. It is, as you know, as we know, complex. We have a part in this and I know other agencies in the city also feel uh, committed to this and also have a part in this. And this is certainly feels extremely important to me, to my staff, and are eager, as you know, to look for all kinds of ways, new ways, which we've established, and we'll continue to look for other opportunities. Um, I'm curious about the data that you're gathering on clients coming, coming in. Um, there is, uh, well, first of all, housed versus on, I, the question of whether a facility like this needs to be in the Tenderloin, in my view, has something to do with whether this is improving lot, the lives of people who live in the Tenderloin or, or not. I'm curious about how many folks are housed in SROs or otherwise in the Tenderloin and are using this facility versus folks who are unhoused and may or may not be from the Tenderloin. Do you, have you gathered we, let me let me pass that. pass the, the mic to Ms. Gaeta. We have some of that information. Let me also just acknowledge that in the effort, um, I really value data and really value assessing the impact of services and know we are continuing to improve our ability to do that. I do want to say that some of the tension of operating a low threshold center is sometimes around data collection, making choices about being inviting, letting people come in, and asking a lot of, and tracking a lot of questions. That said, we do have some of this information that we'll share, that we're happy to share. Great. Um, so while I don't have the exact figures in front of me, when we opened the Tenderloin Center, um, part of the intake process was asking a few questions um, to every person who walked in the door. One of those was, what is your housing status? Um, the vast majority of folks reported being unsheltered. There were definitely folks who were housed, but vast majority unsheltered. We also asked a question, which neighborhood do you identify with? Do you hang out in? Do you live in? Um, and the vast majority of people self-reported the Tenderloin. As we move forward with wellness hub planning, we are being very thoughtful about data. Again, as we mentioned before, this was an emergency setup. It was very fast, and we had to put in data systems quickly. But we, get, we understand the importance of data and are looking to, to improve in that area. 
Um, at a recent uh, GAO hearing, uh, the chair and I had a little tussle about um, uh, unhoused folks being from San Francisco, being from other places. I'm curious if you're gathering information. Sound, I'm guessing the answer is no, but whether folks using the Tenderloin Linkage Center were last housed in San Francisco or elsewhere. No, we didn't collect that particular data point. And we found the folks that were using the center that were from outside of San Francisco, very minimal, like nominal. Um, based on anecdotal based on self, a a yeah, asking. This is all self-reported. We're not doing investigative yeah, So it's work not a question it, you're asking, but it is your impression. It is my impression that most folks are it's San Last Francisco were based in San Francisco. In San Francisco. But okay. not, we did not ask that exact question, okay. no. Great. How much is the linkage center costing us each year? So this year, so we had an annualized budget. It was about $22 million. Um, so I think the six month budget was about like $10.6 million. Is there any evidence that the linkage center is reducing overdose deaths in the Tenderloin or citywide? Um, thank, thanks for that question. So let me share what we know and, and maybe some uh, additional questions. One is we know we have reversed about 280 overdose deaths. Some proportion of those um, would have been fatal. And so we really importantly see those as lives saved. So starting there. We did not see a decline in the city. Um, uh, overall, again, using preliminary data, we don't have final data from 2022 during these, this, this period because of finalization of cases by the, the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. We also did not, it does not appear that we saw a rise in overdose deaths during this period. And so this is always a public health tension would it, and, and uncertainty. Would it have been worse? Um, we don't believe that deaths have gone up. That is good. And we know we reversed a good number of overdoses in the center, saving, potentially saving that many lives. And that is good. And that is sort of, I think, the, the conclusion at this point, given current data, that I would make. OK. Um, well, I do want to thank, I mean, I think, uh, I think there have been flaws with this model. You've identified many of them. It was too large, the not operating 24-7 and dumping uh, a large number of folks who need to use regularly, who are going to have to use before they come in the, the door the next day and are you know, going to be an impact on the immediate neighborhood is a big problem. Um, I think we've learned a very valuable thing, which is that we can do safer consumption facilities, and I am supportive of doing that. Um, I am not supportive of this resolution, however, because I have, as you at DPH know, a ton of priorities for the Department of Public Health. I think that the fact that we do not have immediate access to a safe place for someone who is in crisis or um, uh, psychotic on the streets, um, uh, that we are dumping people out of PES in our emergency rooms well before uh, they are ready to be, to be released, that we do, that our first responders are finding that they do not have places to take people who are ready, who have been revived after an overdose um, and are willing to go into treatment, but we do not have a place to take them. And the fact that we do not have enough places for people who are completing 90-day treatment programs and need a safe place to go, and the fact that when people even have a step-down facility, that, um, that we are so often returning people to SROs in the Tenderloin as their ultimate destination, where um, I would just note I did an in memoriam for uh, former Sheriff Vicki Hennessy's son, for whom that was the exact situation, after 18 months of sobriety, returned to a unit in the Tenderloin and was dead within um, two days. So. Um, I have many things that I want from DPH, and um, I would like further exploration of safer consumption facilities, um, and it is not top of my list. So, thank you.
Thank you, Supervisor Mandelman. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I will just say that this is an area where I, I, I really want us to focus as much as possible on what the areas of disagreement are and what the areas of agreement are. Like, I, I think that, I don't think there's a dispute around certainly DP, DPH's stated commitment to wellness centers as part of overdose prevention planning, the mayor's commitment to that, at least in signing off on and, and announcing that plan. Um, I believe even from the Reser Mandelman's comments around um, some other priorities that, that and, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think you, it sounds like you're positive as well on the idea and probably supportive of what's in the overdose prevention plan in terms of having more safe uh, consumption and wellness uh, hubs and overdose prevention work. So, so I don't think those things are in dispute. I, I mean, I think really what's in the, the source of tension right now, uh, certainly between our office and a lot of folks in the neighborhood um, and health folks on one side, and to some extent the administration on the other, is, is the timing of when a wellness hub, like I think, I think we're actually all okay with the idea that we're gonna learn some of these lessons as you've laid out, you know, around the size, I think, you know, the idea of scaling down, having more sites rather than putting, going all in on one mega site. Um, and, uh, and I haven't heard serious questions around, I think the assumption is we're gonna fund that work that we need to do as part of the overdose prevention plan. So I, I don't think that it's an either or around funding other priorities or doing other things. I think it's literally just a question of, are we gonna light the fire and get it done with a replacement in, in or around the tenderloin uh, in time to continue serving folks or are we gonna leave folks uh, with, with uh, without uh, recourse in a way that's going to be harmful and end up with people dying. Um, so I, I did have just a couple more follow-up questions before we go to public comment, and thank you to all the folks who've been patiently waiting on public comment. Um, one was just to follow up on some of the data and research questions and comments. Um, I, I think at our previous hearing, um, there were, on the overdose prevention plan, we were told that there was research that was underway around the Tenderloin Center. I believe uh, Dr. Krull spoke to some of his ongoing work. Um, I, that's, it's been several weeks or a month now. I'm wondering if, what's the status of that? Has that work been, been completed? Are there any findings uh, that, you can, that you can share in, in, at this time? So that, that work is underway and, we're, and we are hopeful that we'll have those findings soon and be able to share some of the lessons that, that we've learned through the evaluation as well. Okay, and any top line, in addition to what you've already said around the center, any, any additional findings that you're, you're able to represent to us today? Um, I, don't, I don't have anything at hand at present, but um, I also am eager to, to, be, to learn from that evaluation. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. We'll look forward to that. And then um, last thing before we go to public comment is on the the finding a site. Um, I wanted to get back to that and we sort of left that, that open. I, I will start by saying I think that it's been a lack of political will, not a lack of sites, although I think finding a site still has its challenges, but we as a city can do that when we set our mind to doing it, right? There were similar challenges when we set up the Tenderloin Center. Where are you going to do it? And it was, and you find a site. I mean, there's 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 a lot of sites right now. So um, so that said, I'm go but I'm gonna take what I'm hearing at face value, uh, being the eternal optimist that I am, um, and assume it is right now the barrier is is a site. Again, I I I don't know, but uh, but let's work with that assumption for a minute. Our help as an office and as the, the new uh, supervisor for the Tenderloin, our help has not been sought in any way by the administration uh, in working together and collaboratively to find a site. We are happy to help in any way possible. One way that we can do that is through this hearing and through the people who I'm always surprised by how many folks do actually watch these hearings and come out of the woodwork. Uh, and that includes folks who own property or control property in the Tenderloin. So if you, we referenced this earlier, but if you could 
with all the disclaimers there that of course every site's different and due diligence and all that, you don't need to do that. We, we all know that. But what are, what are you looking for in terms of size, in terms of outdoor, indoor mix, in terms of, you know, what are we talking about? Are we talking about an empty parking lot? Are we talking about a small building with a backyard? How many square feet? What's going to make the cut? And what, for those watching who know people within the Tenderloin, who own property or know someone who does, uh, if we were to able to turn this around quickly, what are we looking for? going to turn us to Ms. Gaeta, who's been deeply involved with this. Yes, in addition to helping run the Tenderloin Center, I spend most of my time <laughs> planning for wellness hubs. Um, the nice thing about this model is it can be highly flexible. So at very minimum, we could do something in an empty lot. Um, that could range from like 2,000, I think ideally 4,000 square feet, where we can bring trailers on site. It's, you know, ideal to have electricity um, and water on site, but we can bring porta potties So there are things that we can do. Um, it's certainly not an ideal way to set up something like this. I think it's, we want to set up sites that are safe and dignified for folks. And so having indoor space when it gets cold outside, when it is raining is absolutely ideal. And so having some combination of indoor space where it can serve as a safe drop-in space for folks, where they can be comfortable, where they can engage with staff, where there's private meeting spaces, where they can um, have private conversations, engage in other planning but with a section for some outdoor um, service area. Um, I think, in an again, I'll just say some ideals, but I would never turn anyone away with a great idea. Um, it's like 5,000 square feet of space. Um, and I think, I think we could work with that. Um, and then obviously we need um, the support of our neighbors and, and, how we, and where, we, where we put that and so that we can work collaboratively together. Thank you. And, and I just want to clarify this, because it's my understanding from everyone I've talked about this, um, from the time we started pu pushing this issue when the closure was announced, I want to be really clear, it is not a, the current budget can cover a scaled down, probably another temporary type facility. Um, of the type you're describing. Obviously, there will always be negotiations on what's a fair market price and so forth. But, but this, is, this will, would not require a new supplemental appropriation or a new budget to get, to get something running through the end of this calendar, uh, uh, this fiscal year. Obviously, beyond yeah. this fiscal year is a budget question for the mayor and the board to consider yeah. in the next budget. But we have the funds to, to continue with a scaled down ver version in acquiring a site and Yes, and for this contracting. fiscal year, we do. Thank you. I think the other thing that I just want to put in is that if we are to lease any site, we would need cooperation from the, the landlord for the, the services we're going to provide. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, and colleagues, unless there are further questions or comments, let's go ahead and open this up for public comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are there any members of the public who would like to make public comment on item number two? Please line up to your right along the curtains. For those on the remote call-in, please press star three to be added to the queue. For those already on hold, please continue to wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted. And you may approach the lectern. First speaker, please approach the lectern. Well, good fucking morning. My name is Jordan, and my pronouns are she, her, or they, them, and I live in District 5. In fact, within a really fucking short walk of the Tenderloin Center, this may be the last time I speak before this board, so I want to make this fucking count. I think the closure of this TL Center, with all alternatives, is fucked up. It's the one part of the bullshit-ass mayor's t Tenderloin emergency declaration that I agreed with. And yet, she wants more cop fucking cops to beat up our marginalized communities. In the absence of truly affordable and adequate housing for us, the Linkage Center has provided, among other things, showers, coffee, living room, referrals, and overdose prevention. And it has been proven to work despite shithead Schellenberger trying to scale the walls and other demagogues. I fucking wish we had something like this in 2015 when I was homeless. It was hard enough for fine things, but as a manic, depressive, autistic, trans feminine person, it was much worse. But this goes to fu bigger fucking problems in the city, which, by the way, is one of the few in California that has a strong mayor system, where that Marie fucking Antoinette wannabe in room 200 can just shut down universe 
neighborhood services unilaterally or unilaterally decide not to fund programs supported by the supermajority of this board. And the board can't do shit about it, nor do they want to have any power because there are too many cowards on this board. Well, it's time for a fucking revolution. I yield my time. Fuck you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Marnie Regan from Larkin Street Youth Services. I'm also a longtime San Francisco resident. And on behalf of homeless service providers, and specifically the youth and young people experiencing homelessness that we serve, I implore you to extend the TL Center until you finalize a replacement wellness hub in the Tenderloin Civic Center so people do not die, or go hungry, or freeze and suffer in despair. We have welcomed referrals from the TL Center of young people seeking shelter, case management, food, hygiene, safety from the streets. We are deeply concerned about what happens when the center closes and no replacement is available. People will literally fall through the cracks from the gap in services, and in the cold and rainy season is particularly cruel. Please listen to your constituents and to the many service providers who are begging you not to close the center without a replacement. People will suffer and die, and it is totally preventable. Also, I'd like to ask what happened to the goodwill on Geary and Hyde that was supposed to serve as a either um, a replacement center or a safe consumption site. Where's that building? Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Stephanie. I'm a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation, and I mainly just want to echo what has previously been said. I feel like the city has an ability to save people. And even though it isn't necessarily something that's going to completely stop the overdose crisis, it's not going to save every single person out there. I feel like every day the person that's saved, that means everything to them and to their life. And it's important for the city to continue to do so. Thank you. Hi, my name is Anne Bleetenthal. I work with the ABD Productions and the ABD Productions and TLC that must continue to be accessible, that must be addressed in existing sites, in new sites, in creative sites. The mayor's office, we're asking, get serious about an incredibly serious issue. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Tina, and I'm a case manager at Code Tenderline. So Code Tenderloin is the nearest navigators. And so it shocks me, like, you know, we went into the center um, thinking, like, you know, it was supposed to, you know, reduce the drugs and the homelessness. So now we back to, like, it's just a drug for drug, you know, it's all about the drug thing. So my thing is, like, um, we all need to keep working together. And then, like, you know, to go in the center and see, like, you know, organizations that's for the city to come in and um, they have offices there. How can we navigate these services if they plan on closing? I want to see it stay open because it has helped so many people out. And then when you get, when people come in, you have to get to know the person first. Some part, sometimes people don't want to stop using drugs at that particular time. But if you keep on befriending them and knowing them, they will. But we have so many places in the Tenderloin that we don't have to have everything in one building. We can have different places in different place, things. Like, you know, if they want to use, let them go use at a certain, at a different building with people in there that can support them. But we need to help the other people that's out there trying to move on with their lives. And if we don't have those services there, how are they able to move on with their lives? But I do know for Code Tenderloin, we will be there for them. And we will like to have that support for we can have that where we could be able to help people and move around in the tender line because the tender line is not a it's ground zero. The tender line has all types of nationality people that work there. And they have all types of people that come in to do services, rich, poor. All types of people are in the tender line. It's not ground zero. Thank you. Next speaker. Linda Chapman speaking for CARA. Well, this is exactly the kind of investment that the city needs to be making. 
a low barrier or no barrier place where triage can be done and proper referrals can be done. Um, you know, so many people who are aging or disabled are left out on the street to deteriorate. And if they weren't mentally ill to begin with, they may become so, or even more so, likely to become prey to drug dealers, although they might not have been addicts to start with. Then from my experience, I'm going to mention again those two young men that I had to rescue from the lawyer who's my HOA president. Uh, the board altered the Karen ordinance to cover people who were disabled because of them, all right? What did one of them need? You know, he was this young man, delusional, terrified, paranoid, and he looked like a college student from UC Berkeley, you know, big football player with a beautiful suntan and so on. What did he ask for? He wanted milk and he wanted a shower because he thought he had, you know, parasites all over him. I was lucky to get the hot team to come and they seemed to be helping him. I don't know what the outcome was in the end. But you know, this is exact, what he needed was to be connected with his family again and with crisis mental health care. The other young man who was black, you know, neat and so on, just seemed to be a little disoriented, a little, I don't know what we would say, disconnected from reality a little bit. You know, he needed, we needed to make sure that he had access to stable housing if he didn't have it, and again, connection probably with his family. What did he actually try to do in our neighborhood? Well, he wanted to use the contractor's honey bucket, you know, and he was attacked viciously by my HOA president because he thought he would use the unlocked honey bucket. Well, we need to have, you know, accessible oh. services. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Thank you. My name is Lydia Branston, and I'm the executive director at the Gubbio Project. And I'd like to talk directly to um, Supervisor Mandelman. Um, while I appreciate your support of uh, services for people who are in recovery. I, I, I'm going to ask to pause your time, and um, we have a general rule at the board. You're welcome to make uh, any comments you'd like, but you've got to direct comments to the committee, not to a uh, particular supervisor. Okay, thank you. Sorry for that. So in general, let me just say that um, before people actually get to the stage where they are considering entering into treatment, they have to make connections. Um, the Gubbio Project is a small and welcoming organization that allows people to come in in a low barrier service as a drop-in. And every day we get to know the people that are coming in because of our low barrier of services and because we ask little questions and we have few requirements of them. And as we get to know them, we get to know what their needs are. And by building that relationship with people, we then have the ability to move people through a system where eventually, hopefully, they get to a place where they increase their health, their stability, and, and oftentimes they want to enter into treatment. And you are correct. It is hard to get people into treatment these days. I spent a day and a half on the phone the other day, and the guy who wanted to go to treatment, we didn't get him in because he left before we were able to actually make that connection. But the thing is, is that he came back. He wasn't ashamed, we didn't punish him. He came back and we did eventually get him into treatment. And, the, and we do need more treatment beds, but we also need those services where people can use drugs without shame and we can actually make those connections because without that, it's always a person-to-person -person transaction. And that's what these, these, these uh, overdose prevention sites are. They are an opportunity to engage a population of people who have very little trust. Please, Please do not close down the center. Please reconsider. And as a, as a board, I hope you all sign and say that this, this center needs to stay open for the continuum of care or people will die. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, supervisors. I'm Sarah Short. I'm with HomeRise. We're a supportive housing provider. And we're also members of the coalition, uh, Treatment on Demand Coalition and the Safer Inside Coalition. I wanted to just bring your attention to a letter uh, that 50 organizations have signed on to and, and actually sent to the mayor's office because we do believe this is squarely on the shoulders of the mayor at this point. Um, 
You all should have received it as well, but uh, I wanted to read some portions of it to you. Um, as Tenderloin organizations and organizations serving Tenderloin residents, we are deeply concerned with ensuring that those currently being served by the TLC do not face interruptions in care. The closure is imminent, um, and we would like your administration to ensure that the city opens a hub in the Tenderloin at an existing or new site, has an opening date uh, for a new hub in the Tenderloin, and a plan for continuity of equivalent level services for clients currently being served. Uh, we believe the closure can be coordinated in a way that doesn't unnecessarily harm our constituents and neighbors by abruptly shutting down life-saving services with no replacement or outreach plan to inform folks of location for new services. That, that's how it is now. Um, in particular, we want to avoid a scenario where shutting down the Tenderloin Center puts people in heightened danger of fatal overdoses and other fatal health risks. Currently, over 400 people visit the center daily and have access to showers, bathrooms, referrals to services, and respite off the street. We also want to make sure that every current client of the TL Center has a reasonable notice about both the closure and the location services and hours of where they will be able to go. Um, again, there's 50 organizations, so I can't read them all, but I'll, I'll just let you know a few um, that have signed on to this. Uh, including AIDS Legal Referral Panel, um, the Coalition on Homelessness, Harvey Milk Democratic Club, Hospitality House, Lava May. Um, Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Good afternoon, supervisors. My name is Hélène Sotou. Last year, when the Department of Emergency Management facilitated the opening of a tenderloin linkage center, the number one recommendation made by the Mid-Market Community Benefit District was to ensure that all surrounding areas were closely monitored to prevent open-air drug dealing and drug, drug sales and drug use. Instead, to this day, the surrounding residents, workers, and visitors see increased open-air use and sales in the vicinity of a center. And According to the San Francisco Medical Examiner reports, even preliminary, there were even more overdose deaths from April through September 2022 than they were from April through September 2021. So we must ask the question, does this model even work? Or does it simply promote more use and more dealing? If a city decides to move forward with this model without answering these questions for San Franciscans, any new site will face the same failures for clients and community members as you've witnessed at the Tenderloin Center and at Soma Rise. Meanwhile, we urge you not to extend the failed Tenderloin Center or open any new such site. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, thank you, Supervisors. My name is Curtis Bradford, and I'm co-chair of the Tenderloin People's Congress, a resident-led coalition of Tenderloin residents. Um, and uh, I'm here today to ask or speak in support of the resolution and to ask all the supervisors to please sign on. Uh, closing the center without a plan for how we're going to make sure that the folks who are receiving services there get continuous and continuity in services is, to me, unconscionable. I can't even imagine that we would consider doing that knowing that we're still in this emergency crisis. The emergency isn't over, right? It was, if this emergency was so important when we opened the center, how come, you know, if we're not through this yet, right? And just closing it uh, with a vague notion that we're gonna open some smaller sites in other neighborhoods um, over the course of a year is, I think, irresponsible and even immoral, immoral in my opinion. We know that these people are coming there for, to get the services. We know people need these services. We know this is an emergency, and yet we're just going to abandon people again. When I was, um, many years ago, when I was using as an addict, and I'm a former and recovering addict, um, I had finally gotten to a place where I was receiving services at a, at a, at a low threshold drop-in center, and I had built a relationship with people there. And um, it didn't happen right away, but at getting services there, I actually got clean. I started to get clean. I actually started making changes in my life. I got clean. They got me in a net of sorrow. I was doing pretty good. Um, but all of a sudden, that center decided to close. 
They just canceled the services. They gave me a warm handoff to another place, but the vibe was different. The people were different. I was treated differently. I didn't have access. Within two weeks, I had relapsed, and it cost me several more years of life using and in and out and on and off the streets. Um, that could have been avoided. We can avoid that right here because that's what's going to happen to people that are receiving services right now. Some of those people are counting on those services, depend on those services, and they're going to be abandoned again. Please don't let that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Sarah Bitten. I have three kids, Solomon, Jordan, Jared, Jordan, and Ashante Lanham. I can't, I, I, I can't get on the internet like you. I'm blackballed. Okay, um, I would like an investigation done, please. Um, at the Monarch you. Hotel where I'm located, okay, where it, it, everything is like Hollywood, I'm, I'm told to shut the fuck up, bitch. Um, I, they cut the phone off, they cut the heat off. I and apologize I'm, to the speaker I'm, for the interruption. I'm, con I'm considered as a snitch. Okay. Um, I apologize to the speaker for the interruption, but we do need to stick to the topic of the item before us. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so can you help me out and just give me a chance, please? Okay, because I'm being tortured every day. And so sometimes I have to stop and think about what I'm saying. I'm blackballed. I don't get the information. You. I can't get on, go on the internet and get the information that you get at the library. I can't log on. Okay, my storages have been taken. My cards have been taken. My Section 8 vouchers that was given from me, given to me at the, before I went to the Arlington Hotel. I came here uh, and spoke on what I was going to. In return, you guys turn around and had them sell the Arlington Hotel and put me out on the street with an illegal um, eviction on my record to get me on a drug charge. I'm not on drugs. I smoke weed. That's all. And you know this because you look at me like I'm looking at you at the Monarch Hotel. They got cameras on the inside of the rooms. Okay? Um, I can't even make a phone call. The phones are, are, are cut off. And I would like to talk to my kids. They moved my kids. Okay, my son, Jerry, they moved Jerry Jordan. He's a Jehovah Witness. They moved him to Florida, okay? I would like the investigation done on um, Mr. Calvin Williams, who the police put out on the street uh, to do a double murder and decided to put me on the street to get to um, try to set me up on the drug charge. I don't do drugs. I don't hear voices that are not real, and I'm not crazy. Thank you. Thank you. So Madam Clerk, do we have any uh, remote uh, public commenters? Yes, we have 10 callers on the line with eight in the queue. Please forward the first caller. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Public comment on this item is now closed. And um, I will just um, conclude by, by saying a, a couple of things that I think are clear from this hearing. You know, one is we have the resources in the current budget where we don't need to be closing this center and terminating services on December 4th, and we could be standing up uh, another site and services. I, you know, we are months from when the site closure was announced, and it makes no sense whatsoever that there is not a more detailed plan for replacement of services and a, an announcement of uh, a wellness hub opening uh, in the Tenderloin Civic Center area uh, to serve the folks who are being served by, by the Tenderloin Center. So I, I unfortunately, this is an example of um, politics being played with people's lives, and I think it's reprehensible, I think it's cruel, um, but I don't think it's too late to do right by all the folks who are relying on these services now and in, in the future. So the administration absolutely could open a site to ensure uh, that one of these newer new envisioned wellness hubs is active and there's no gap in services. And I haven't heard anything that, uh, that suggests we couldn't do that. Uh, thus far, the mayor's refused to do that. 
Um, and I think it really undermines, very unfortunately, undermines the stated commitment and I think some of the progress we were making toward a public health-led approach to overdoses and the overdose crisis in, in San Francisco. So that said, my office remains eager to collaborate with the mayor's office, with Department of Public Health, to identify a new wellness hub and get it active as soon as possible. Uh, I'm hoping something comes to my inbox in the upcoming days uh, from someone who listened to this hearing and wants to be part of the solution and actually has control over uh, some property nearby. Uh, so let's hope that happens, um, but we will work collaboratively to, uh, to try to identify and open a new site and also to e extend services on site. I cannot for the life of me understand and have really not heard any reason whatsoever why there would not be a short extension if, of the current services if there is not a new site announced um, by that time and, uh, and at minimum a, a real detailed plan to ensure no gap in services. So we are uh, on track here to fail the neighborhood, fail the people who are relying on this uh, center and who are some of the most vulnerable people in our city after we have done an experiment which is the opposite of failing the very folks here and, and, and is about being bold as a city in trying to solve our crisis. So there's still a not, it is not too late. I wanna emphasize that. I think we can change course on this. I'm hoping our resolution plays a role in that. Um, and unless there are further comments uh, or questions from colleagues, um, I would like to go ahead and uh, make a motion to send this resolution to the full Board of Supervisors with positive recommendation as a committee report. Madam Clerk. Thank you. On the motion to forward this to the full Board of Supervisors with a positive recommendation as a committee report, Vice Chair Chan. Aye. Chan, aye. Member Mandelman? Mandelman, no. Chair Preston? Aye. Preston, aye. There are two ayes. And Member Mandelman in the dissent. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The motion passes, and uh, thanks to uh, everyone from Department of Public Health, Mayor's Office, and the public uh, for uh, their participation in this hearing today. Um,